Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I am honored to be here this evening and introduce our guests. Adriana Trajani is the best-selling author of 20 books of fiction and nonfiction that have been published in 38 countries, including The Shoemaker's Wife, Very Valentine, Cooking with My Sisters, and Lucia Lucia. Also an award-winning filmmaker, playwright, and television writer and producer, she directed the documentary Queen, Queens of the Big Time and wrote and directed the film adaptation of her debut novel, Big Stone Gap. This evening, she joins us with her latest novel, The Good Left Undone, an immersive story of three generations of Tuscan artisans with one remarkable secret. This evening, she'll be joined in conversation with Pam Jenoff, a New York Times bestselling novelist and a professor of law at Rutgers University. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the Free Library. So um, I want to welcome you all, this is hometown crowd for me, and I'd like you to give another round of applause, I'll tell you why, to my friend Adriana. I saw you, what, Wednesday in Charleston. We, we were, were at Charleston. an event together, and in the five minutes I turned my back, her new book, The Good Left Undone, hit the New York Times. Thank you. So we're going to jump right in. I have a lot of questions. All right. We, we just hung out but in Charleston, but I didn't There's get to Lynn. ask her a thing. Philly girl president. And I have questions. Oh. Um, and then we're going to leave some time for you. And I know Philly always has questions. Um, so let's jump right in. Your brand new baby, The Good Left Undone. It's been, what, a week? A little more? Yeah, a one week. week. What's well, today? Monday. Monday. So today, six, Monday? Six in six days? days. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Six days. So I'm assuming Six that not everybody days. has read it yet, you will, but tell us a little bit about it for those who have been busy these past six days. You know, um, this book is, um, it took so many years to write this book because you know, I had one idea and I was working on that idea and then I got a job directing a movie and I wound up in Scotland. And when I got there, I found out there were Italian Scots. I didn't know that. I had no idea. There's so many aspects to this thing, Pam, that are so, uh, I don't know what the word is, dreamlike, sometimes magical, sometimes coincidental, crazy. Um, so I, I initially was writing about the family Cabrelli, these gem cutters for the Vatican and what happened to the family business, because I got this kind of bee in my bonnet about family stories, because I have the great privilege of traveling, and so I get to talk to a lot of women. And I realize why the history of women has been lost, because we're too busy, really, to record it. <laughs> so I'm on a little bit of a mission, and wrote this novel to hopefully in in your imagination spark an idea about writing down your family stories why you still can because there comes a moment when you won't and i want you to get it on kind of the side where you feel you can you can do it and and nothing fancy i'll walk you through it once we talk a little bit more but uh it it, it, it it's imperative it'll change the world It'll change the world if we take responsibility for our family stories. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all good. Amazing. So this book features, as many of your books do, strong women. And in particular, this book has three main women. So can you introduce us to your latest crew? Well, I don't know about you all, but my mother passed away, and so I miss her terribly. So my mother is in my consciousness at all times. And my grandmother's... It's as if, I, I mean, I call on them every day. So I thought, well, if I'm going to dig in deep, I'm going to kind of base them on the real people. Then I'm, I don't feel as bad. I don't know why. Only time I'm, I'm in my imagination. Same reason I only have good-looking men in my books, because if i got to spend four years with them, I don't want it to be some <laughs> troll. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, because you can see, the men are always so tall and handsome. Hey, what do you want from me? 
<laughs> that's what's living in there, and that's what you're going to get. Re really, who wants the alternative in a novel? I don't. I mean, I want to see Mr. Rochester, you know what I mean? And he better be good looking. Anyway, so, um, so my grandmother Viola is really oozing in Matilda because my grandmother said things when she was alive that really made me laugh that now, you know, on her deathbed, I was standing there and I, she looked up at me and she said to me, I want to tell you something. Don't ever touch your nose. I said, is there something wrong with it? And she said, no, well, don't touch it. Because later you need it. It's like a tent pole. It holds everything up when you're old. <laughs> and you know every morning when I brush my teeth, I go, she's right. She's right. <laughs> she's right. So Matilda is kind of a... Um, She's not the grandma with the cookie jar. She's the grandma that tells you you need to lose a few. She's that grandmother. We all had one. We had one of each, right? One of each. One of each. It's just the way life works out. So uh, Matilda is a bookkeeper in the family business, so she worked in the family business. And there's one other interesting thing that I just want to say, because I know your questions are phenomenal. I learned something writing this book over this long swath of time, which is this. Before World War II in Italy, this family for generations were gem cutters for the Vatican. They didn't make any money. They got you this way. They go, you're doing it for the honor and glory of God. I mean, they were commissioned, but they used the God card. And so they, they, they were paid meager amounts of money to do it. It, it. it still exists in some ways, but not to the degree. You know, prior to World War I, the largest employer in Italy was the Vatican. After World War II, that changed. So this family changed with it because then their, gem, their jewelry store became pieces they owned and cut and sold okay, to the public. So it, they became prosperous. And there is a direct line between prosperity and families losing their identity and stories. Why? Well, we don't even need an answer, do we? Because when we get a little scratch, nothing else is more important than the money. Sad, right? Okay. There we go, Pam. That's, that, there's a runway for you. Amazing. Where to begin? Where to begin? So okay. I want to go back to Scotland. Can mm -hmm. we do that? So um, I, I love how Adriana casually says, yeah, I was making a movie. Because I am a one-hit wonder. I do nothing but novels. But you do like all this stuff. The yeah, I'm a dramatist. And... I'm really initially a playwright. And that is the worst career. That's like worse than <laughs> being a poet, which is the worst of the worst. Which is poets like one inch above dancer. Dancer's like the bad one um, in the arts. But you can rank them. Not that it isn't a noble profession and a great profession, but you really can't make a living. And I don't come from a place where um, uh, somebody's going to hand me money just to be me. I had to figure out how to make money. So I was a dramatist and I wrote for television, which is the, you, it's the best way to make money that you can find. Because look, they own you, you work seven days a week, who cares? You do the work, you get paid well. And not only do you get paid well, when I was doing it, which was up to like, well, I can't say because I just did a television script, you get in this union and you get a pension. Now, I'm worried about the kids in it now because they can't get the pension because we, we used to do 24 episodes a year. Okay, like I, I, my first job was a different world. We did 24 episodes. You can get, you can get your, your union, your vesting within seven years. You have to have a certain level of income, which, okay, well, it's good. Now it's almost impossible to get in, and I don't, I, I don't know. I have to get involved in the union because it's not fair because everybody's working hard. They're just not, they don't, they don't get, you don't get residuals. You don't get, no, you paid up front. I tell you that only because I had to make a living. So playwriting I always do, but it, it's going to not make me my, my living. Television will. And then novels can, but you really have to do it. You have to. I didn't. I don't know any other way to do it than the way we do it, which is to just 
always be working on one and get it out there. Um, did that answer the question? Well, you answered a I've lot of. There's like doors. It's what's like, happening, Lynn? Lynn, I'm drunk. Is that what's doors. happening, Lynn? Lynn's like, like she's drunk again. I, I, I don't know what happened to her. I can handle it. I was a lawyer. I took depositions. I got gotcha. you. So, um, but what I want to go back to Scotland. You're not leaving yet. Um, so oh, yeah. let's. Oh, how to get that gig from Scotland? Well, no, you I deterred me. You threw me off. The I path. do from Scotland. I want to know how did this gem of a book? Like, how did you step into it in Scotland? Well. Um, so w when my books come out, I do the Today Show. I'm just going to tell you like the whole story. I'll keep it short. So I do the Today Show, and after one of them, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford had just been widowed. And she said I wrote a screenplay. And, you know, your heart sinks because it's like, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> However, I read it, and I, I got home, I read it, and I called her that afternoon and said, look, I dropped, tucked, and rolled, and I read it. There is a really great central idea in here, and I like the characters. And she said, well, will you direct it? And I said, sure. And she said, will, will you work on the script? I said, sure. You know, um, because you always say yes, because 99.9% .9 of the time, nothing happens. <laughs> but she's a pile driver, and she got the thing set up. I mean, she had the movie set up. So the next thing I knew, and... and uh, she guest hosted with Craig Ferguson, who is very, he's an interesting cat, because he's also a novelist. Everybody on the movie could write, which was good, small cast. But he, he's extraordinary. He, he, I love him. He, I work with him again anytime, anywhere. He's just that great. And they had a chemistry, which was good. And then we added some elements. And, All right, so I get over there, and I'm in Scotland. Now, Scotland you could visit Scotland in America if you go to where I grew up in Appalachia. It looks just like it. It looks exactly like it. And they have this accent. I was the only American who could understand the Scottish accent because it sounded Appalachian to me. <laughs> well, they are Appalachian, so it made sense. So I have a weekend before we start filming. So I had done book tours through there, but when you book tour in the UK, you're, you're in a place one night, you know, it's just like, you know, a cup of tea and you're on, your, and you're, it's over. You don't really linger anywhere, and I always said, oh, I want to go back and linger, I never did, so now I could linger, I'm in Glasgow. So I'm walking around on foot, and I made a list of all the places I wanted to see, and one of them that I was really interested in was St. Andrew's Cathedral, because it was Protestant, oh no, it was Catholic, and then flipped to Protestant for 350 years, and then now it's back to Catholic. And I, you know, I know my Protestants and love my Protestants because I grew up with my Protestants and their churches were always very plain, whereas the Catholic churches were always ornate, right? So I wanted to see what was left from the 350 years. Was it plain Jane in there or was it pretty or what was it? When I get there, there's a wedding. And I am a wedding crasher. I don't go to the re reception because I know that that's expensive. I do go to the services. We believe in our Italian tradition that it's good luck to see a bride on her wedding day. My phone is full of brides. Like if you ever run out of dress, I just call me. I will send you. I will send you a drop box of brides. I, because they're good luck. And my daughter even now understands that that's what we do. We still, hey, got a bride. So I get there, and here's this wedding. So I'm standing in the back of the church, and it's me and the bagpiper. <laughs> and the bagpiper, the first thing you need to know about Scottish men, I, I was calling my friends going, there's a lot of single men over here. Now, the bad news is they live with their mothers, but the good news is they're single. Okay. <laughs> and they're very handsome, and they're tall. It's a whole thing. You know, it's like, I don't know, the ghost of Mrs. Muir. Handsome. <laughs> So I'm in the back of the church, and I, the, the music that's playing during the, the bride chose for her wedding mass were the exact same songs my mother chose to play at her funeral six months earlier. I know. So of course, I'm crying. And the first lesson of Scottish men is when you're crying, they like creep away. They creep. They think <laughs> like she's nuts. So then I sort of like, OK, got myself together. Mass ends, we go outside, and I start taking pictures. And nobody seems to mind that I'm taking pictures until this happens. A man behind me says, who are you? 
And I turned around, and it was the priest. I said, oh, Father, I'm just a tourist, you know. He said, what's your name? I told him. He said, I knew it. You're Italian. I said, yes, Italian-American. He said, you need to go see that garden. Now, the church was, like, really old, and next, this garden had a low wall. You couldn't really see in it. It wasn't that low, like maybe eight feet. So you couldn't see over, but it wasn't too high that you thought, oh, there's something in there. And then kind of the bride leaves. Everybody starts getting in their cars and leaving. And so I wander over to the garden, and I get in there, and I don't know what I'm looking at. There's no, there's like not a instructions. There's not a plate, only the architect's name. And then there were these giant shards of glass mirrored with ancient Greek philosophers sayings on them aphorisms like you know uh, like I got lost in the ocean it swallowed me and I lived or whatever it is you know some Greek thing and I'm thinking this is weird we're next to a church why aren't these things religious you know like Jesus wept why isn't that there but it was all like non-religious so then, but there, you, there's such peace in there. They, they built a modern stream with a trough of, of aluminum, kind of. It's really, it was really beautifully done. Okay, so then, I'm like, what is it? And there's nobody around. I'm alone in there. So I, I thought, I'm going to walk around the outside of this thing, just see if I could find a sign in here. And then I found it. It was like the wall was, you know, it was embedded, like in relief. And there was a plinth on the wall. And on it it said, in memory of the victims of the Arandora Star, the Italian Scots who perished on July 2nd, 1940. So I'm alone in the garden, and I read the names out loud. And I become, oh, I I'm, I'm have an emotional reaction to it. Now for me, and I don't know if this is true for you, I got to feel it. If I don't feel it, it's pointless. You can't fake it. You guys know when you read, you can't fake that. Those of you who are writers, you know what I'm talking about. You have to, it has to be in your bones. And I thought, oh, I'm feeling this deep. This is so deep, this one. So I took a couple of pictures and I, then I went, I, I canceled my day. I went back to the hotel, called my researcher, who happens to be my best friend. Uh, she's a lawyer in Spokane, Washington. And I said, look, I heard, she, I said, did you ever hear this? She said, no. Now, every, has anybody ever heard of the tragedy of the Arendora Star in this room? Well, guess what? My British publishers never heard of it. But I know why. Because it was, it was Winston Churchill's grave mistake. And, and look, great leaders can make terrible mistakes. And he did, and he owned it. And six weeks later, he, he rescinded the order. But basically, the order was this. Because Mussolini declared war on the island uh, of England um, on um, June 10th, 1940, they scrambled. They scrambled to get any spies out of the country because, as you know, and certainly they talk about every night on the news, when they fight a war, they enter from the water, always from the water, because that's, those are your borders that are soft. You can get in, okay? If, if you come over mountains and stuff, it takes a long time. But it doesn't when you protect your, the periphery. And I didn't know any of this. I mean, I'm talking like I'm a general. I'm not. I'm just telling you what I learned, you know. But I had to kind of picture it to, to tell it. And, I'm a, and Winston Churchill, I cut 300 pages from this novel of Winston Churchill because I became quite obsessed about him um, and read a story about he and Orson Welles, which if we have time I will tell you later. And I, so I had these 300 pages, but it was woven into this book. It was woven. It was in there, which I, 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 I ripped out because I decided when I wrote it it doesn't matter what his feelings were. It was bad. And there's no way to justify it. And there's no way, this isn't a novel about him. It's about what these kind of decisions do to human beings like us. Okay? So he, um, 
the other aspect of this that's it's really important to share with you is when you go in to do research, you don't research the year something happens. You go, I go back a generation and I try to read autobiographies of people who were alive then because they can best describe their, their lives and times. I didn't live then, I have to guess a little bit or feel it or channel it somehow. So what was so amazing was this story didn't just happen overnight because Mussolini declared war. That was part of it. That was the, that was the match that lit the fire. For 11 years prior to 1939, so let's say like 1927, there was, there was a, a large immigration of Italians into England and Scotland. And there was propaganda against immigrants. And it's chilling because the Italian Scots, who none of you knew about, and I didn't know about, were like Italian-Americans or Irish-Americans, German-Americans, Japanese-Americans. We never say the African-Americans in this group because our, our brown people were enslaved. And there's a difference. We're talking about the immigration. And this story was fundamentally the story of the slow drip of misinformation and lies to people. And I personally paid thousands of dollars to print one of those articles in this book on page 252. What is it, 252? I'm sounding like my grandmother now. 252. It's there. A guy named John Boswell in the Daily Mirror. It was the most damning leading up to this. So, so basically what it when you read it, you'll see. You're just reading along, and you think, oh, it's real. Now, I credit it, but you, as a, you're reading a novel, so you go, oh, maybe she made that up, but I did not make it up. So what, what was the story? Well, the Italian Scots uh, were the first people to bring fish and chips. Somebody said, well, that's an English dish. So what, did you ever eat calamari? <laughs> it's, a, it's their version of calamari. Um, gelato, uh, uh, gelato, and um, they also brought um, uh, pizza. So mostly food services, and the men who came over and worked just, you know, you know when you have um, somebody from another country that comes and works on your stonework or something, or your road. This is exactly, it's the same throughout time. So, so some of these guys came over from Italy, and they worked in the service industries. So the maitre d' at Claridge's was an Italian. The maitre d' at the other hotels, the, the waiters. Why? They were good looking and they worked hard. They liked the way they looked. Uh, they liked the exoticism of them. Till they didn't. Now, Churchill, of the 300 pages I cut out, the only other thing I want to say about him is he loved Italy. He went there and painted. He painted in Germany, Italy, Switzerland. He, he, he was a beautiful painter. And you can't even touch his paintings now. They're millions of dollars, but they're quite beautiful. And so he didn't hate the Italians. He just had a problem he couldn't solve quickly. So he panicked. So he said these words, collar the lot of them, get them off the island. Men of Italian descent between eight, boys as young as eight and 11, and as old as 80. Keep in mind, just like you're in your families, we have all these veterans. I got veterans. My grandfather was World War I. My, my other grandfather was a raised bonds. My father was in the Army. You guys got people in. I have an aunt that was a whack, you know. Okay, so you, you have the same thing. But none of that mattered. None of it mattered when this happened because they were the other. Prior to World War II, Italians were considered brown around the world. We're Mediterranean. We were brown. That changed. Hey, don't, don't, don't think that my, my, my beloved group has it licked. They, 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 
they have anti-immigrant sentiments now. Some, not all, few, some, half, fourth, I don't know. I haven't done a poll. It's appalling to me. Appalling. And, um, and when you read this, you just realize it the same stuff keeps happening over and over again. All the stuff they said about the Italians, is that we were dirty, we were brown, we were lazy, we ate garlic, we're weird, we have a different language, we're loyal to our mother country, not to the country of our, of our immigration. And we all know that you can be loyal to the country you live in and love your mother country, can't you? You can love two things at one time. Don't you have two kids? You can love them both. No logic. So the setup of this is, is that this thread got lost about the Scottish side of this Italian family. Did that answer that question? <laughs> so, what did, so for those who haven't read the book, what did they do to these, what happened to these people? Can you say without, mm. you know, I don't want to take they away They rounded from the them up imprisoned them without cause and shipped them to points around the world. If you ever go to Australia and you have pizza and there's Italians there, it's, they were, they, yeah, they're descended. Canada, the Falklands, New Zealand. Not to America, of course. Uh, but there was a prison camp that in this particular, in Canada, that they were taking this group to. And what they did and, and, and by the way, for anybody, is anybody here Jewish? Oh, how good. You know, I don't go anywhere without my, my Jewish sisters. Okay, it's just <laughs> a habit of mine. On this particular boat that I write about, and there's also a storyline of, of a Venetian gem cutter who's tight with the Italian gem cutter from the other coast, because they're all connected. They all go to India together to get rocks for the Vatican. They cut for the Vatican. In this particular just this ship, and there are many you can study, I found out as I was doing this, but I chose the one incident on the one ship with the one. When they rounded up the Italians, there was no resistance because it was like they're, they're neighbors picking them up and going, oh, we gotta register you, and you know. And they sent them to this silk factory called Worth Mills in Liverpool. And all the trains came through there. So you had the Italians, in the bottom of this luxury liner that was wrapped in barbed wire to take them to Canada, but they didn't tell them where they were going. And on the second level were Nazi war criminals and what they called Jewish intellectuals, which were the professors from Oxford, Cambridge, scientists. They put the Nazis with the intellectuals. Can you imagine? And then the Italians in the bottom. And the bottom is usually where you stored the meat and the, I mean, there's no room down there. You packed them in there. They wrapped them in barbed wire because they were now prison ships. At the time, there's no sonar, so the U-boats, you know, U-boats were shooting off torpedoes everywhere. You, you didn't know they were there. But there were Nazis swarming England underwater, swarming. And that this particular morning, July 2nd, this, this, uh, commandeer that, that general, uh, horrible, diabolical man named Gunther Preen had one torpedo left and he was going back. He was going to go all around Italy, go up to the Black Sea, he's going to go, you know. And he sees this ship transporting prisoners. They don't, they, they, in fact, it's worse. When they were painted this great, they were hospitals, floating hospitals. And he hit the ship. He blew the torpedo into the ship, and the ship went down. Now, those that were in, they were encased in barbed wire. The Nazis managed to get off and into the boats and paddle away. Everyone else was doomed. They tried to tear through the stuff. It, 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 it's horrible. I described it as best I could. Um, I think it's pretty powerful because you love these people that are on that ship. Um, the insanity of it is that, is that when the ship went down, some people survived it. And they scooped them up. Like, you remember when you had a goldfish? Kind of scooped them up in that, brought them back to Liverpool, did not let them contact their families. There's a father-son that are split apart. One makes it, one doesn't in my book. 
and he's not allowed to contact anyone. They put, he, 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 they, they put him on the next ship to go to Canada. Now, how do we find out about this? Well, it was, it was so badly, it, they didn't report it. They acted like it was an, um, that everyone was saved. Well, there was no way to tell the, the Italian Scots, the women, that their men had gone down on the ship because they weren't going to tell them anything because it was wartime. So they never knew. They never knew except when one survived and came back five years later, they could tell the story. But in the paper the next day, they made it look like everybody was fine. It was a little accident, but it wasn't. It wasn't. So, intriguing to me always is who, who we cast in the role of other. Amazing. Amazing. If that doesn't make you want to read it. Um, so I and, and I'm gonna wave to Laura in the back and just say I cannot see the clock from here, so I could talk the whole time, but please give me a flag when we need to go to questions because I'm just gonna keep asking Adriana otherwise. So you've touched upon Where's everybody going? We got nowhere to go. All night. I'm We're out of the here. house. We're here. It's we got nothing to watch. We're here. It's all good. Um, you've touched upon it a little bit, but I want to talk about research, and here's why. I once sat next to an author who wrote modern books, and she said, yeah, I just kind of turn on a computer and start typing. And I went, you know, you what? Because Adriana and I know there's a whole other job going on here with historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear it. I want to hear it from your perspective. How do you approach it? How do you weave it in? How do you not screw it up? How do you do it? Well, that's a good, it's a really good question. You know, Anything you read is through your lens, is through your imagination. So what is intriguing to me is what the rabbit holes I go down. You know, um, I mean, I was stunned to find out there were Italian Scots and I had to know everything about them. Who are these people? Why'd they go there? I explain why in the book as you're reading it, so I won't ruin it for you, but you have to figure those things out. But also history is interesting because, first of all, half of history is not recorded because there aren't, you can't find any women in it. I want to say that again. Half of world history is not recorded because you cannot find women in it. And please don't say Amelia Earhart. That's like one lady with an airplane, okay? <laughs> That's hardly what I'm talking about here. Okay, or those, or those authors on the old maids cards, okay? Not them, okay? We know Jane Austen, okay? We get it. But I'm talking about women who make our, our history become history, and it's lost. It's lost forever, which is why I'm on a campaign to make you write it down, to make you, to ask you, to beg you to write it down. Anything that you were told, that you remember, you can put a recipe in there, a notebook just for that. It's the most valuable thing you can leave your children. Forget the jewelry or any of that stuff or the dishes or the silver. The stories are the gold, really. And when I go to write one of these, my research is my attempt is to create a family story to make it so layered and enticing that you want to keep turning the pages. And, and, you know, you find that when you're writing. You, you fall in love with the people, and they come alive. Amazing. So you've told our friends here a few times to write down their stories. Yeah, I'm really on a, I'm on a mission. <laughs> such a powerful mission. And I want to talk about a related mission. I want you to tell us, because I really want to know about your work in Appalachia and your work with the, am I going to say this right, the, the Origins, Origins Project. Project. Yeah, yeah, tell yeah. us about that, please. Well, you know, I'm from Appalachia. So is my doctor, Stephen Williams, there in the room. <laughs> and when we were growing up there, um, you had assemblies in school. We got around a little bit. We went to Charlottesville for forensics, which was always exciting. We took the tour of Monticello. Boy, has that ch It's fantastic now. You know, we'd go, who's? We'd always, go, we'd always say, um, 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 but they told not the truth there. They just didn't tell us the truth. And then over the year, we went so many times, we could give the tour. 
I mean, you know, went up to Monticello. So, it, you know, it was, a, but we'd always go, who's James Hemming? James Hem Hemmings made this bench. James Hemming made that clock. James Hemmings, James Hemmings, and then Sally Hemmings was, what? Okay, read Annette Gordon-Reed. She tells it much better than I can. So, so, so the, the, in Virginia, we, we, it's a state where you start studying state history when, in the fourth grade. Now, things have changed, and we don't have assemblies anymore. And I would visit the schools when I went home to see my mom, and I, I what, what, who's here for assembly? So it started sort of with the idea that in Appalachia, we're not taught to be proud of our Appalachian stories and our roots. We're not taught that. There's a little anger uh, and stubbornness about, y you know, I never talk about politics, and I won't tonight, but I understand the divide in this country. Because you're basically telling people they're stupid, both sides, and that they, they don't know what they're talking about. In Appalachia, that is not done. Um, I never saw it that way. Um, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to have a program that didn't cost any money. I did not want to fundraise. So I said, a pencil and a notebook, and then I will, I will do the workshops and bring in authors. Well, Nancy Bowmeyer Fisher, who's the co-founder, is a philanthropist. She knew that that was not possible because to bring, you have to bring people in. It's Appalachia, you got to get, you know. And so we, we figured out we do a little bit of fundraising but, um, and, and appreciate any donations, but you don't know, worry about it. Um, it. We've gone from 40 kids in grade nine, we realized we were too late. Now it's kindergarten through 12, and we have 25 schools and 2,500 students. And here's what we do. This is the program. Stole it from the Bank Street model. Anybody here teachers? You all studied this. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So I'm, speaking, I'm preaching to the choir here. Okay, so Bank Street model is one project an entire school year to you finesse it. It teaches rewriting as much as writing, so, okay, so I loved that. So we took that idea. We go in with a journal for every 2,500 kids, first week of school. This is your journal. You make it your own. You, you, put, you put your name and your address in the front, but you can change the cut. We don't care. Make it yours. And we want you to just write down ideas about things you see and give them a little exercises to do. But write down what you're feeling. And then you're to pick one topic, and the teacher guides them, and then we're there too. We have retired teachers, Linda Woodward, to get in there and work with the kids. And you choose one story that will be published in an anthology at the end of the year. We've done eight of them, these big door stoppers. These are kids who never owned a book, and they're published authors now. So they're right, and, we, and it has to be about your roots. Well, now... You know, when I was growing up in Appalachia, you could probably kind of trace either Scots, Irish, African American, Melungeon. We had our little groups, and then, then you had the coal miners. You had Italy Bottom and Big Stone Gap. They all went back to Italy. We can't even find those people, but we were Italians that came in the late 60s, so you see, the stories are really interesting and different. So we work on it for the entire year, and I bring in guest authors because there's no, there's no assemblies anymore. With the guest artists, which we used to love, you know, like the, the museum curator would come and the fire chief would come and, you know, just the superstars of your community. <laughs> and, uh, and now we bring in great renowned artists to, to work with the kids. Now, during COVID, we went virtual, which is fine. We did a lot of, and we're having fun with illustrators now because a lot of kids want to draw. And we encourage that, too. So that's the origin project in a nutshell. Oh, and at the end of the year, before they get their books, they do these assemblies. They're called unveilings all around the state. Amazing. So they have to get up and read their stuff, which is always like, oh, you know, that's a tension convention, but it's always fun. I, I wondered, after you finish a book, do you ever think about what happens to the characters after that? Like well, Valentine. And, and like Valentine? Happens? Yeah. Oh, I always think I'm going to run into her on Perry Street. 
Yeah, I, 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 don't, I think that's, it's all real. When I get a big stone gap, I think Ave Maria's coming around the corner. I really do. It's like weird. Um, I don't shake these people. They're kind of with me all the time. Not in a weird way. <laughs> I, I, don't think it's we I don't think it's that weird um, that I would expect to see them. Because I know how they think and what they look like and who they are. It's like a friend. But not really. Because you can put your hand through them. Right? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I say, uh, they, they never die. And the rest of us will, but they don't. <laughs> Mr. Rochester. <laughs> he ain't going nowhere. Question, I, re I read the book. And, you know, there are those passages when the Italian Scots are being rounded up, which are harrowing, and you can't read those pages and not think of the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Absolutely. I'm sure that was in your mind. Well, yep, the internment of Japanese Americans, German Americans, and Italian Americans. And so I, I'm, I'm wondering, is your sense that the Brits have, have they reconciled with that history and have, have any better than we have? And is it, okay. and is it better known history? What a great question, Mikey. I'm going to tell you what I think. That garden was built in 2010 on the 70th anniversary of the sinking of that ship. It took them 70 years. Now, there's a, there was a chapel in, in Italy, in Tuscany, where all these Italian Scots were from. That's it. It's an unknown thing. And it's hard because, you know, Winston Churchill was a good guy. No matter, I think, for everything I read. Was he? What I like about Churchill is that he's the underdog. He was old when that war started, and I'm very fascinated by that. I wonder why. You, the, the people who reinvent, reinvent, reinvent. And in the 50s, he was trying to get back on the horse and run things, and they, they wouldn't, after all he did for them, he, he couldn't even get it going. It's terrible. And that's why I wanted to do the arc in the book, and I wrote it, but I took it out. Because... The British people, now this is just my observation, what do I know? I love them. The Scots are different from the Brits, as you know. The Scots, though, have been wiped out in history several times, the men. They've lost the men, so the women are very put upon. They remind me of my family, the women in my family, but it's put upon. You know what I'm saying? And grousing, complaining. Now, I'm right in there, too. They, that's what it reminds, like, they, they, every time they got it to get, they lost their sons, you know. So there's that. And then, and then in terms of the English, there is a real, there, there's a real embedded sense. These are good, wonderful people, but there's a class system, and you feel it. I feel it when I'm there. And I and even and traveling through the country. There's a if, if we were gathered like this, there you could feel they wanna, they wanna be, you know, you're looking at me with affection, okay? They want to, but they can't kind of can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. And then later they'll like, they'll squeeze your hands till you think they're gonna snap off. I mean, they're they're full of passion and and dumb. Um, and aspiration, you know, pretty much if, you know, it has not, e it, it has not evolved. I guess is how I would, except they're, they're, they're good people and smart people and, and, and hardworking people. I just think that sometimes they, I feel like they, they know their, their place, which they shouldn't feel that way. Look at America, we think we could do anything, don't we? <laughs> mm -hmm part of the fun. Did that answer that, Mikey? Pretty good. Okay. Yes. Oh, hello. Hi. Oh, did you go back to the church and talk to the priest and tell them that you were going to write this book? And if so, what did they say when, when they found out? When you get the book tonight, you'll, in the last page of the acknowledgments, I never got his name and I, I thank him. What am I going to go back there and say? What do you say to this guy? He gonna be, look at me like I have two heads. I mean, maybe someday I will. 
yeah. and send it to him. And I don't know who, I actually have a picture of him on my phone. I could, I could track him. <laughs> because after he did that, I, I took a couple snaps of him without him knowing it. Because <laughs> I'm the crasher. Who are you? All right, back off, Father. Nobody asked you. Hi. Hi. Uh, you advise the women to tell their stories, and I so agree with that. I love writing stories. And but what what do you advise for the next step? I mean, how do we tell the? Do you want me world? to give you my how tips? Do, yes. I'm so glad you asked, <laughs> sister of mine. Okay, look. Here's the deal with being with a, with writing or anything creative. Just get up two hours earlier in the morning. I know, don't moan. I know, it's horrible. But it isn't after a while. Because when you start to own your own time, you, you, you think you're going to create at night, but no, it's not really the way it works. Because after you've slept, your brain has been working for you. Power Your Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. Get that book. Okay. You have to have a place where you do this creative work. In New York, don't laugh, people are in closets writing because it's, it's a sacred space for them and there's nobody bothering them in there. You don't have to do it that way, but what you can't do is carry your notebook around. I want you to get a notebook and a pen, go to Walmart or somewhere tomorrow with the hard shell on it, not the soft kind. And you're not allowed to put anything in there like somebody goes by and goes, did you get that? Did you get the address or where do I, I need to return something to QBC? You don't write that in this book. This is only for the family stories. It's only for what you're going to write. So sacred space, sacred notebook, sacred pen. I don't even, Andrea will tell you, where'd she go? Who's my trusty assistant? She will tell you, I can tell when somebody's touched my pens. Don't touch my pens. I'm from a big family. People touch my pens. I get crazy because I write. They, they tilt a certain way. So in other words, I want you to wed yourself to your tools. You could do it on your phone and your, your computer eventually, but the notebook is important because it's not only symbolic, it's tactile and you could touch it. And you can write on the, my family stories and date them. And don't put pressure on yourself. Like one day you'll just go, oh, I remember the way that peach pie smelled at the end of July when, when my grandmother made it. And then go on a hunt and get that recipe put in that notebook. You start to, the building blocks of the creative lives that have been led. Okay. Then, if you get up two hours early every morning, eventually you're going to get into this routine and you're going to savor it because it's the only time in your whole waking time that you can really truly think. And to think, you need time and quiet. Nothing buzzing, nothing going. Nobody bothering you. And once you do that, you're off to the races. Is that helpful? And I also say this too, sleep, sleep is, there'll be times when I'm working on a book, I lay down on the floor for a minute just to, just to close my eyes. Because this is capable of everything. Even the pea brain that I have can retain information. Begin to work with your heart and soul and mind, again, all synergistically. And you may just like get up one morning and just in that notebook write, my grandmother's ceramic teacup had a fracture in it for 42 years, and the cup never broke. You're going to remember things. Or why was your grandmother's formica shiny, like a school, and you go to try to make your floor shiny, you can't get that one. You know what I'm saying? That's, give me the visuals. Tell me the colors of things. Tell, you know, when my grandfather died, my grandmother, we, we, the, when people die in our families, we act like they're not gone. We do not get rid of their clothes. It's, they could be there tomorrow. My father's voice was on the answering machine for 12 years after he died, okay? <laughs> it was embarrassing, but funny. You know, but if you missed him, you just called, and you, you heard him. <laughs> and my mother, didn't want to change, my mother didn't want to change the car. She didn't want to change anything. The clothes are really interesting 
because in your home right now, you have clothes of your ancestors, and you know you do. And you have the handiwork of your ancestors. You know you do. How about when they used to make those tablecloths? How about those doilies? You, you have, you think you don't have anything and you have everything. You have everything. And so that should be incorporated into what you're doing. Is, is, is what object do I have that has a power to it? A lunch pail, a thermos a fork, a typewriter, a piece of art, a pho photographs are the best. I have them all around all the time because they, they speak to me. And whatever speaks to you, you use. Is that helpful? Yeah. And if you forget, just call me. Hello. So I feel like you're part of our family. We, we read your books and we talk. You're so much better looking than my family, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to take you on it. I'm going to take you up on I, it. I, you're, it's just very relatable, and I, I treasure your stories. So when your book came out, of course, I've already read it. Of course. It was phenomenal. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. I just want to know, though, is there anybody in the story that is real? Is there any parts that you are like? I'm glad you asked me that question. Yes. Okay. When I did the research about the Arendora Star, it, first of all, it was hard because of the propaganda, and then you had to wait, and then and they're not really sure how many people died. They, they, they can guess by who didn't come back, but it's still, I know we lost some people we, don't, we can't account for. But my favorite was this priest. And you know I read a lot of priests, and I just get a kick out of them. It made me laugh. I always felt bad for priests when I was a kid. Anybody here Catholic? Didn't you pity him? <laughs> I thought that was the most pitiful thing in the world. It was sad. It was sad, unless they were good looking and they were Father What a Waste. And then it gave you, some, it gave you, something, gave you something to look at at Mass, you know? And your mind was wandering. You were like, oh, he's cute. Yeah, well, how sad is that? It's so sad, isn't it? I still don't understand it. I can't believe like I'm getting ready to die and they still can't get married. I'm like, what, what, what are you doing? I write letters all the time. They probably think I'm a crackpot, but I don't care. <laughs> I think they should be allowed to get married. What is this problem? What is going on here? Um, anywho, what was the question? <laughs> I went down, I just saw a good looking priest and I went. Oh, thank you for getting me right back on track. Okay, <laughs> Father Fricazzi is real. Father Fricazzi is, was the one priest on the ship. Now, why was he there? He wasn't there to be a priest. He was rounded up with the other Italians. He was an immigrant, and he spoke Italian. And he had this, like, you know, the Catholic Church in England, is, you know, it's, it's like the poor church, kind of like it is in the smaller parts of the country. Like, I had no idea that the Catholic Church was big till I moved to New York. I really didn't. Where I'm from, it was less than 1% of the population, so we were like the island of misfit toys. I mean, was, who are these people? <laughs> anyway, so, so, in, so this priest, Fricazzi, when I read his story, I thought, oh, I like him, I like him, because he was, his roof was leaking, the floor was broken, the, you know, the pews were cracked, the, you couldn't kneel because it fell into the floor, I mean, it was a mess. And to raise money, he rented out the church basement for meetings. And unfortunately, he rented it out to some fascist meetings because that's where they'd meet in churches. And he got nailed for it. And he, he was saying morning mass, and they hauled him off. Now, when I say hauled him off, again, it, they didn't know this was, they were being imprisoned. They did not tell them. So what do the Italians do? They're like in their best suits, Sunday shoes, hats. They took pictures of them. They looked like a million bucks walking basically to the gallows. And they knew these guys. They all knew each other. So it wasn't like they didn't trust their, their, their fellow Scots or their fellow soldiers or the sailors. They, knew they, were all, they were all friends. Some of them intermarried. It was completely, it was like it'd be if, if Lynn said, oh, listen, we got to go sign a something, something at the something. I go, I go with her. I wouldn't question her. Till they got to the mill.
Now, when they got to the mill, they started to get suspicious. Now, so they, they, they were in their suits, and they had one, most of them had like little picnic baskets because in, it was a big thing in Scotland at the time, these little straw baskets from Italy, you know, even a little handle, weather hand. So they put in a change of socks, change of underwear, and, and, and a sh new fresh shirt. That was it, in case you needed it. And then the rest was salami, <laughs> provolone, uh, a bottle of wine, and loaf of bread. Everybody had a loaf of bread. And one of my favorite scenes in that book is what they do with the bread. They're one of my favorite scenes. And um, I loved him and how he died with such dignity. It's not ruining it. You'll forget it by the time you read it. But <laughs> it, it, when you get there, you'll be like, um, yeah, he's real. My dear. Okay, yeah. really quick, since we're talking about characters, I'm really curious about how you build your characters, if, especially when they're based on people maybe that are real. Do you feel, like, do you map them out to a point where you know who they are before you even start writing, or do you kind of let them evolve and, and tell you where they want to go? Well, I see them when I, when I see the story. It, pretty much in, in specificity, I see them. They're very, very real to me. So I don't create them separate of that. This scene that happens at the mill, I just wonder what it would be like if it's a if it's a room full of these poor, you know, professors that have been banished and these Italian maitre d's, you know, they're dressed well, almost in a tuxedo kind of looking thing, and then men in their Sunday best who peddled ice cream, you know, this, and, and what happens when this priest walks into that room? Some who are not believers are like, uh, but the ones that are afraid now have an advocate in this, in this other prisoner. That's the stuff I like. I like the interaction. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I thought a lot about my grandmother when I was writing a Nina, the granddaughter, and, and the kind of stuff that I did with my grandmother is the kind of stuff they do, but it's the kind of stuff you did with your grandmother, too. So it, it, makes, it, um, it makes it real and relatable. Yeah. One more, two, 17 more questions. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here today with you. I love your work. And I wanted to just I make two quick comments. What is your name, my dear? Donna D'Angelo Struck. Hey, Donna. <laughs> and I, I've been writing my mother's immigrant story for years. She came to Philadelphia in 1950 from Italy as a teenager. Yeah, let's entire, talk about Philly. Left her entire family yeah. behind. Her story is amazing. But I have to tell you, though, when I read Lucia Lucia back in the day, I think that's what inspired me to write her story. It really did. I'm not, I'm not making that up. I feel like because her, my mother's story and Lucia's are similar. That makes me so happy. She, Either I don't have words. She came in the 1950s. She was a seamstress in Philadelphia, See? not in New York. But so I want to thank all you right. for that. You're hitting it. <laughs> yeah. All right. It, the fiction's there. That's good. That's that's good. It's good that it's emblematic, or but consider that the sort of the, the portal to which you go through with your story. That, that you can take those fundamentals and get that story down. I'm also going to say this to anybody. You don't have to be Italian-American, but it helps. Join the, <laughs> join the National Organization of Italian-American Women. Join it. You, 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 they help you shape your story. Children and great grandchildren, and they're all benefiting from her story. And we all knew it was special. But I have to tell you, after I read that book, I'm like, I know I need to record this. But the second comment I want to record in, her. Yeah, absolutely. Just record absolutely. her, even if she doesn't know it. Absolutely. Just record her. Yeah, absolutely. And the second thing I wanted to say was that I was in Scotland a couple of years ago on a life-changing trip in the north of Scotland in the Orkney Islands. There's an Italian wedding chapel. There's a chapel made of yeah. paper. There's, it's, th it was built by Italian prisoners of war who did it in their spare time. They were brought over they as They put them there, yeah. Isle of Man, and then yeah. shipped them off. Now, Orkney, that church that was built by hand, it's like they made like origami almost and built this thing. 
It's standing there. They asked me to make a movie about that, to set a fictional story there. But then I, I went, oh, I just want to hear a door store better. I did that. But that chapel's important. Yeah, but they, they, they roamed free as prisoners there. See, even the, they didn't even try to escape the Orkney Island. They didn't. These were their friends. Where are they going to go? They were like, where are we going to go? I was saying, and hopefully get back to Scotland when the thing was over. But the point is, when you're an immigrant, you're an immigrant, you're an immigrant. You, you, you're waiting for that knock on the door it's for them to say, get out. And I just want us all to think about that. Right? But you, know, you know, again, nothing political, but the suffering at the border needs to be solved. And by the way, I, I, I don't think anybody over us is going to solve it. I think it's got to be us. I don't think they get it. I don't think they get it. And um, the disdain for people. They did that to your grandparents and your great-grandparents, and don't forget it. I think that's my one pet peeve in all of life is biting the hand that feeds you. That really annoys me on a very fundamental level, maybe causes some anger. But I'm going to take a class so I don't get too mad, but <laughs> I'm just going to say. That lack of gratitude, you know, I just want to say, wherever people gather, just go when they're speaking a language that's not yours. Just go there and be present with people and look at them. And you see your family there. You see your, you see your history there. We forget that. And uh, particularly when people are vilified. And that's what they did with this in this particular thing. We were all criminals. We were all in this drip, drip, drip of propaganda. And now it's worse because they're on TV saying it. I watch, I watch them flip my older people in my family. I watch them do it. Now, that's not to say because the bar is so low, then the bar low gets low on the other side, on the side of righteousness. The bar goes, the bar is so low now, we could like jump over it. There is no bar. In fact, there's nothing. So it's up to us. And then the other thing, point that I'd like to make from history and research is you got to pay for journalism. You got to pay for that. Those are professional writers. All my research that I've done all these years, and I know you too, we use hometown newspapers. Edna Ferber learned how to write at the Appleton Press in Wisconsin. She never went to college. She won the Pulitzer, the Oscar. Every lit she was a best-selling author. Edna Ferber. She grew up as other in her town. And her father was going blind. She's one of my favorite people in all of literary history. But she just did her job. And she learned how to do it. And, and, and they're masterpieces. So the small town newspaper that is getting gobbled up or dying, is that, that's, that, there, there goes your truth. There goes the truth. We have to defend it. And we have to subscribe. You can get deals. It's just so your voice is heard in there, that you're reading it. Don't, don't, don't go on Facebook. <laughs> That's not journalism. You, you can pick the people you like, who you think are sharp, but, but, but that's a large chunk of what I use. And, um, and in this particular book, The Good Left Undone, it was a lot of that. We, we really combed the newspapers. So I would like to thank you all for giving my friend Adriana this warm Philly welcome because I know it means she will come back for the next book. Thank you so much. Thank you.